From planting churches to being only days away from launching a new e-commerce venture, this entrepreneur is on a mission to create a business for good. From Blue Tribe Media, this is the Good Business Podcast, the show where we talk to business leaders, social entrepreneurs and innovators about aligning profit with purpose and how you can make doing good, good for business. Now here's your host, James McGregor. Today's guest is Paul Warburg, who's literally at the beginning of launching a brand new e-commerce company called Wendigo that is focused on sourcing sustainable products. Now when I say at the beginning, Wendigo only went live a few days before this podcast episode. So it's literally right at the beginning of his entrepreneurial journey. But Paul's no stranger to being an entrepreneur. He's actually a serial entrepreneur who's been starting businesses since he was in high school. And his experiences also include something called church planting. Now, Paul's looking to combine his passions for business and charity by building a business that has sustainability as a natural part of its everyday operations. Because Paul believes that the best way to tackle the world's problems is to build self-perpetuating movements that combine profit and purpose. Now, when I interviewed Paul, he was just two weeks away from launching his new business. So this interview is the first of two. So this one we're going to talk to him before the launch and then we'll check in with him in a few months' time to see how it's all going. But in this episode, we talk about his background and what's driving him to set up a new sustainable e-commerce business. We discuss church planting, because seriously, that actually is a thing. And we talk about the challenges he has faced so far and his expectations for the future. Let's check it out. People who don't know who you are, why don't, why don't we actually start off with you introducing yourself and uh, telling us who you are? Yeah, sure. So my name's Paul Warburg, uh, and I'm the founder of a new company called Windigo. Uh, Windigo is a small startup e-commerce company. Um, we're focused on sourcing and producing sustainably made consumer products. And we actually have two major goals for our company. Our first goal is to make it easier for people who are already committed to sustainability to find sustainably made products. Um, and our second goal, really our primary long-term goal, is to uh, lower the barrier to entry for a sustainable consumer lifestyle in order to hopefully attract new consumers to a, a sustainable lifestyle. Uh, so is there something that most people probably wouldn't know about you? Sure. Uh, in seventh grade, I was absolutely addicted to video games, in particular a game called RuneScape, so much so that between the summer of seventh grade and the start of my ninth grade year in high school, I actually spent 260 full 24-hour days uh, playing a game called RuneScape. So I've definitely improved a lot over the years. So, uh, so the end, 260 what? Full. 24-hour periods. Uh, 260 24-hour periods. Wow. Yes. That, that that would have to be in the Guinness Book of Records, wouldn't it? Surely, <laughs> surely, unfortunately, surely. unfortunately not. <laughs> but that did cause me, once I, I learned that, to kind of reevaluate that a little bit. Yeah. I think the best I ever did was probably 12 or 13 hours on Space Invaders when I cracked the million. And I, I also you had to take a photo of the screen and you send it into, I think it was Atari back then. And they send you out a little certificate saying you'd, you'd scored a million plus on, on there. But unfortunately, the photo came out all blurry, so it didn't quite work. But anyway, oh, they still, cool. sent me the, still sent me the certificate, so they took me on the word. Um, so what, what, do, what would you describe as your superpower? Uh, definitely learning. Um, I really enjoy learning, watching documentaries, um, reading. And I've just been able to build a lot of principles and habits in my life that I think make me better at learning new things, which makes me always be growing and always getting better. Now, before we get to uh, Wendigo, I want to go back a little bit in time. So obviously, now you've decided to launch this new business and it's focused on sustainability. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and it is and where does this passion come from? And launching a sustainability business is probably not the easiest business to launch of options you have out there. So what's what's actually driving you around making the world a better place? Yeah. So actually this kind of starts a little ways back and there's a lot of steps in the middle of the process. But really I think it starts with uh, my Christian faith, which kind of caused me to look at the world and not in terms of what I can get out of it for myself, but what I can do to give to the others around me. Um, I kind of learned and experienced uh, from the time I was a child to live my life with a focus on other people. And um, I found that I'm happier personally when I focus on other people than when I focus on myself. So I guess you could say that I try to be selfless for selfish reasons. 
What, what triggered this particular interest, I actually, uh, I was in seminary. My original plan was to become a pastor. But I, like I said, I watch a lot of documentaries and I was becoming very aware of a lot of issues in the world uh, through those documentaries. All right, and, yeah, and three particular issues that kept coming up that I noticed around a particular theme. And that was kind of a theme of hopelessness. A lot of documentaries were talking about people feeling hopeless for their future job prospects for themselves or their children because of things like uh, automation, artificial intelligence. Uh, a lot of people feeling hopeless about political and economic future. Uh, and a lot of people, of course, feeling hopeless about the environment and sustainability issues. And so I sort of um, realized that these were important issues that I could at least partially address. And so I tweaked my plan a little bit. Um, instead of being a pastor that started churches myself, I decided that I wanted to start businesses and use the uh, income from those businesses to fund other pastors to start churches and kind of multiply my efforts there. Originally, the first business I started, it was a simple goal of providing just at least a few hopeless people really good job opportunities. I had a really hard time finding my first job. Um, nobody wanted to give me an opportunity. And so I wanted to start a business to help other people get kind of their first opportunities. Um, shortly after starting that company, uh, my vision sort of developed as I came up with this new idea, kind of centered on sustainability, and that's what I'm pursuing now. So, so why why business is the vehicle to do this? Why why not some other approach like a not for profit or a charity? I think the main reason that um, I'm pursuing a business rather than a not for profit is I think a business can be self perpetuating. As a business, if it's profitable and if the product that you make is actually doing a good thing, then you can sort of scale that to infinity and just continue to be profitable and, and making things that people want rather than asking for donations. And there's nothing wrong with that. I just think that you can make a bigger impact by making profits and then being able to invest those profits in philanthropic ways. Yeah, yeah, hundred hundred percent. There used to be a perception that profit and purpose were like at two ends of a different spectrum, um, mm -hmm. and that you could you can only be doing one or the other. But I think today a lot of you know brands and companies are saying actually those two things are mutually supportive. So you can have a purpose driven company that has profits that can be reinvested into growth to deliver more impact, uh, and you get this you know this nice um, self driving cycle or of a business that supports itself but does something uh, good in the world. So. 100% there with you on that. You mentioned before, and I want to segue into this because one of the fascinating parts of your background is this idea of church planting. Now, this is a term that I, one of my favorite podcasts is a podcast called Startup and I actually followed a church planter as he, as he went around and I think it was in Detroit and the whole process. It was a real, there were so many parallels to starting a social enterprise of course. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, how do you, you know, recruit people to come and join the church and how do you keep it financed and how do you bring team members on board and get volunteers so tell me a little bit, a little bit about this your church planting background. Maybe, maybe start off by telling people what actually is church church planting. Yeah, so church planting is very simply the process of uh, starting a church, and it's called church planting because it's I guess the idea is like you're planting a seed that then kind of grows organically, and so you're not trying to necessarily grow something or make it large in and of itself. You're trying to plant the seeds, and then somebody else comes and kind of waters those seeds and grows them and makes them larger after you're kind of done there. So it's sort of like the entrepreneurial side to being a pastor. You are the one going out and starting new ventures rather than running them. And then you kind of hand it off to people who have better skills in that area. Now, tell us a story about the, the church that you set up. And uh, yeah, how, so, did you, I mean, how did you even go about what, what was the first thing you did? So I was uh, going to seminary and my original plan was to become a pastor. And I was just looking for jobs at other churches at the time. But I realized that uh, my current neighborhood, my current city um, had a need for churches. And so we simply uh, got a small group of people from the church I was a part of at that time. And we started meeting in my living room on um, originally on Wednesday nights. And we kept going to our original church on Sunday mornings. And then once we got a little bit larger, we kept meeting in our living room on uh, Sunday mornings. And the plan was to uh, eventually, once we got large enough, to move into a local movie theater. They have you know cheap auditorium seating. You can rent it for a few hours at a time. You don't need to manage the building and maintenance all the time when you're not using it and just kind of scale from there, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah it makes perfect sense. I mean, the, the living room, that's a minimum viable product, as I would say, in, in a yes. real venture. Um, and where you're testing the waters until you're bursting at the seams and then you move into a, a new premises. 
out of curiosity, so how, how do you fund a once you've got a church up and going? Is it, is it through donations from the members? Like what's the what's the sort of the financial model look like to keep one of these things running? I mean, you obviously got space. You need the rent. You yeah, you need resources to yeah. uh, get out and see people. And I assume you're probably supporting a range of social issues in the community. How, how does all that work with with it, with a with establishing a brand new church? Yeah, there's a lot of different models. Uh, a lot of people start through an organization. We did not have an organization, so we were entirely self-funded. And so that, that actually kind of is how I got into starting my businesses. I was working a full-time job at the time, and that wasn't really providing quite enough income. So I kind of started the business while doing the church at the same time. Um, any funds we needed were coming from either that or from donations that uh, our small church body was making. So I guess that was a good foundation for starting a business. And, and you look like you're a bit of a serial entrepreneur, having started several businesses now. So let, let's talk about this new e-commerce business. Like, tell, me, tell, me, tell me about what's the what's the problem you think you're solving in terms of, you know, the customers are going to be using your service. Yeah, so our, our primary customer, at least to start, I think, is the consumer that wants to live more sustainably, but they're having a hard time finding products that support that lifestyle. Right now, there's a lot of sustainable products that exist. Um, they're kind of all over the interweb, so to speak. But to find them, a lot of people have to follow a lot of different sustainability blogs or do a lot of research, You know, follow different YouTubers. And, and it's a lot of work. And in order to, and when they do find those products, what I'm finding is most people are only finding a tiny percentage of the products that are out there. So they might find, you know, for example, one cool brand of shoes that's made from recycled coffee filters, or they might find one jacket that's made from recycled water bottles or whatever, or they might find a, a certain number of zero waste items. But in the, their everyday purchasing decisions, if they want to find something sustainable, they have to do quite a bit of research. And the products that they find often aren't quite what they're looking for. So what we're trying to do is really do the classic job that retailers do, which is helping brands get discovered by consumers by bringing all those brands under under one store. And so what we're trying to do is create a website where people can go. It's a one-stop shop. We've done all the vetting process for them. We found a lot of unique, sustainable products that people are searching for. They may not know they're searching for them, but we're kind of looking at data and understand that this is what they want and um, putting those in a place where they can discover them. So what's, what sort of products are we talking So you mentioned, you mentioned a couple of those, you know, some shoes made out of you know, recycled coffee filters. What, what types of products are you thinking about at the moment? Right now, we've got a big focus on apparel and like a lot of kitchen type products, a lot of products for your bathroom and your home. But really, our ultimate goal is to provide pretty much any product you can think of, or at least a version of it. So whether that is a toiletry bag when you want to go on vacation, whether that's your toothbrush, your watch, your shoes, your clothes, your toothpaste, any any product you can think of is our overall goal. And it kind of in a sense, I don't know if you guys have Target out there in Australia. We do, yes. Yep. Target. Okay, so yep. uh, Target's a big retailer here in the U.S. We're kind of trying to do something like a Target or a Walmart where every product is made sustainably. But an, on, an online version only. It's to start with an online, but we do actually have some plans, hopefully, to open physical retail stores eventually as well. So have you done anything to validate that there is demand? I mean, what have you done to confirm that actually customers are looking for these types of products? Certainly. So we are doing a lot of um, market data research, kind of looking at what people are typing into Google, obviously. There's also um, a growing movement right now, uh, the zero waste movement, and there's a lot of smaller retail stores that are finding a lot of success, getting a lot of funding, getting a lot of customers, specifically around um, zero waste, which is this concept of trying to well, reduce your waste, obviously. And so what we're kind of fleshing out is a more thorough version of that same niche. And so at least that aspect is definitely um, successful and has demand. And for the rest, we're kind of going off market data and hoping that our original tests will prove correct. So what's your launch plan? Are you going out with like a small subset of products? Like what, what's the plan for when you go live? Yeah, we've got just 100 products for when we first go live. Most of these are going to focus on zero waste. We're working with about 20 different suppliers right now um, who make things like out of, for example, backpacks made of recycled water bottles, um, jackets made out of recycled water bottles, um, shoes made out of recycled coffee filters. And we're hoping to get those on the site within the first month of launching. We're kind of doing a soft launch to get some data that we can work off of as we progress. Uh, and we want to 
regularly be able to add new products and keep things fresh. So rather than kind of waiting till we have everything ready to go, we're kind of doing soft launch and progressing as we go. And how are you handling distribution and logistics? Yeah, right now we've got uh, a small warehouse. It's my garage. <laughs> <laughs> MVP, that's great. <laughs> yep. And uh, we, we've set up uh, agreements with a lot of our suppliers as well to do some drop shipping. Um, that's not what we want to do long term, we, but we are examining what's going to be the most carbon friendly. And so we have looked at a number of different options, whether that is um, different warehouse logistics companies that we can ship our product to different locations across the United States and eventually uh, Europe and Australia so they can uh, have shorter shipping times. We're looking at possibly doing some things in-house with distribution and logistics or um, a combination of that, as well as having suppliers handle it um, with local customers that are close to them. Yeah, great. I'll have to hook you up with the guys from Sendal. So they're an Australian startup that's just launched in the US. So they're um, 100% carbon neutral uh, distribution. So That'd be they, great. Yeah. Uh, I'll, put, I'll put you in touch with the guys there. So they literally just launched in the US, I think, just before Christmas, so for the Christmas period. Uh, I'm not sure what areas they service yet, but I'll uh, I'll put you in touch. So that would be a very good partner for you guys uh, going forward. Awesome. So what's the you've had this idea you've you know moved through to get ready to launch I man what's what's been the biggest struggle do you think so far what what's the thing that's keeping you awake at, awake at night at the moment nothing necessarily is keeping me awake I think I've done that before in my past businesses this time we kind of planned out all the steps I have some experience in e-commerce so I kind of knew where I was going but the the main struggle has obviously been logistical um, we have right now identified 1400 suppliers that we really want to work with we've contacted most of them and they're happy to work with us as well but with a limited budget and limited warehouse space we're only able to uh, carry so many products at one time and so we're trying to determine what our priorities are what products we're going to source first and um, how we're going to grow into that full list so have you actually sold any product yet as part of like a bit of a validation test uh no that'll be c coming in uh, march so is that is that your plan for rollout you're gonna you know you mentioned you got this small subset of products as the idea is just to actually prove that customers can they're actually willing to actually pay and buy these products and you can ship it from a to b in a reasonable time exactly that'll give us uh, just enough revenue to um really hone down our shipping practices, make sure that we can have enough revenue to set up some sustainable systems. Um, so our first few sales won't be as sustainable as our second or third or fourth, but it'll get better as we go. And we want to make sure that we start small enough to have those systems in place. Yeah, right. Okay, great. So so I, um, I mentioned that the uh, introduction, this is going to be like a, this is a two-piece interview. So this is like, you know, you've got this idea, you're getting ready to launch uh, you know, about a month's time from now. Is that about four weeks from the date of this interview, roughly? Uh, our plan right now is March 1st, so it's about two weeks. But Oh, about two weeks away, okay. It could be two to four oh, weeks, you know how things are. Okay. Yep. All right, all right. so this, this episode should actually be going live probably around the time you're launching, uh, and then we'll uh, ch check back in with you a few months down the track to see how it's all going. But you know, I think there's a lot of people in the audience who would love to be able to do, um, you know, launch their own business around now solving some environmental or social problem. Based on, I guess, what you've learned up to this point, and we'll ask you this question again in four, four or five months' time, what's the single biggest lesson that you think you've learned so far and what advice would you give someone who's thinking about doing something like this? You know, I found, um, especially when I was starting to plant churches, that sometimes you think that the mission itself is enough and that because you have an important mission, the venture will be successful, but that's not necessarily true. I think it's definitely important, especially for those of us who have important missions to invest in ourselves, grow personally, grow our skills and our understanding so that we know what it's going to take to be successful. Don't just rely on the fact that we have a mission that's important, but take the fact that we have an important mission and understand that if the mission is really important, that it's really important for the right person to be leading it. Um, invest a lot, you know, personal growth, reading, personal health, because if you fizzle out, then the mission fizzles out too. I think I see too many people, they get lit up with a really important mission. They have an accurate thesis, I think, about the change that needs to be done in the world, but they misjudge how hard things actually are. Um, they dive in too soon, thinking that the mission will sell itself and uh, ultimately end up abandoning the mission or not going as far as they could because they haven't thought about being great themselves. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I think that's a really, for people who are wanting to launch businesses that also do some good, I think it's really important to understand that not all your customers are going to necessarily buy into that mission. I mean, that's, that, that, that may not, may not be the reason why they're exactly. engaging with your business or buying your products and services. 
um, but it should be a consequence of them doing that. Um, and so when you communicate that, I think the, the episode, back actually in episode eight, it was a really good example of that of some guys I mentored through an entrepreneurship program. And they started off with, we're going to save the world from climate change. And the uh-huh. first thing I did was, sh- first thing I did was shut that down. I went, look, well, that's a great mission, but nobody cares. And by that, I mean, it's not like no, nobody cares about it. It's that they're not going to buy into your product or service for that reason, right? That, that should be an, an outcome of them consuming your product or service, which is awesome, but don't lead with that because you'll immediately um, polarize your audience. So, yes, I think that's a really important lesson for people to learn. So, so I'll be interested to see. I'll be really interested to check out your site when it's up and check out the messaging and how you're, uh, how you're positioning product as well to sort of have that mission in, in the background. Although I think with your particular target audience, you, you might be able to be a little bit more overt given that they're probably already looking for sustainable products and services anyway. Yes. So you know, for your niche, um, it's probably not as critical to avoid that, I guess. So so to the important question, when it does go live, uh, how can people find the site? Like, where should they go? Obviously, yeah, of course. So our website will be located at Windigo. That's W-E-N-D-I-G-O dot eco. So W-E-N-D-I-G-O dot E-C-O. If people want to connect with me personally, they can uh, definitely reach out on LinkedIn. Um, my name there is, of course, Paul Warburg, uh, spelled W-A-R-B-U-R-G. Feel free to connect. Send me a message. I will happily accept the connection and converse with you. Awesome. All right. And we'll provide all those links uh, in the show notes. So people are running or driving their cars at the moment, they can uh, check in later and uh, get those notes. And then actually when you go live, we'll, we'll post some stuff out through social anyway as well. So people awesome. can go and uh, check, it out, check it out for themselves. So how about uh, let's wrap it up with our uh, mad minute. So five quick questions in, we'll try to do it in 60 seconds. I'm going to have to come up with another, you know, because I'm doing this as a two-piece interview, you're forcing me to come up with uh, five new new questions for the second time around. So that might be a new format change for us in the future. So let's go. So what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? A few things happen quickly. Uh, Commit yourself to consistently improving through small incremental habits rather than trying to do everything at once. And you can accomplish anything you want as long as you play the long game and give yourself enough time. Uh, Great advice. Uh, What's your favorite business book? Uh, Right now, it's The Everything Store. That's the story about the uh, founding of Amazon. Right. That's probably very appropriate given where you're at. When you were a kid, what did, what did you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to be a, a Navy SEAL, and then I tried training for that by joining the swim team, and I realized I hated cold water. <laughs> uh, yes. So I guess if yeah, cold, cold water and Navy SEALs are like uh, tomato and basil, I think they just go together naturally. So uh, if you don't like it, yeah, it's probably a good, uh, good career choice. A uh, bit of a change, though, from Navy SEAL to pasta, I must say. Yes, that's another story. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, maybe we'll save that one for the next episode, maybe. Um, so what's your, what's your favorite quote? Happiness is uh, not about having the things you want. It's about wanting the things that you have. And if you go back in time and give your 20-year-old self some advice, what would it be? question's a little funny when I was reading it because I'm actually uh, only 24 now. So, you know, a whole okay. lot of wisdom if you, by 20. All right. If you go back and, and give your 10-year-old self some advice, what would it be? Oh, man. Uh, you know what I what I would give to my younger self, even though I'm still young, is uh, slow down, have a 15 year old vision, not a 15 minute vision. You have plenty of time to accomplish things, especially when you're young. But you'll never accomplish anything if you keep trying to get things done quickly, get frustrated, give up, start a new thing. And so I'd say pick something, commit, do it slowly and consistently rather than uh, be a serial entrepreneur, kind of how I've been through my, most of my 20s here. That's awesome. So for, actually for the next episode, so people listening out there, maybe if you uh, follow us on Twitter at Blue Tribe Co, so B-L-U-E-T-R-I-B-E-C-O, all one word, uh, actually, and send us a message about what questions you'd like to ask, ask, ask Paul for our uh, Mad Minute in the next episode and we'll see what we uh, get through. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'll really be watching closely to see how you go. Uh, I think it's a great mission. I've obviously got a, a, you know, the bright skill set, I think, to, to launch this business. And uh, we'll uh, check back in, back in with you in a few months' time and see how it's all going. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, James. Well, we'll check back in with Paul in a few months' time to see how it's all going. Now, whenever you're developing a new idea or trying to launch a new business like Paul, one of the fundamentals of, of developing any new product or service uh, is to make sure you understand the problem that you are solving and for whom. The problem is at the core of any great product or business. And what we find is that people really struggle to actually craft their problem statement. So to make it as easy as possible for you, we've actually created a free downloadable guide to help you craft a problem statement that you can actually test all the various elements of it, and it's available in our resources section of the website. 
and get a copy of this guide and also access today's show notes, simply visit www.bluetribe.co forward slash podcast. Coming up in the next episode. For too many years, environmentalists have tried to convince business just on the money and we, are, we have a worse environment for it. In the next episode, our guest leads an organisation that has been a powerful voice for the environment for more than 50 years, and she believes we need to change our approach if we are to get business into the business of good. Well, that's it for another episode of the Good Business Podcast. I'm James McGregor. Until next time.